welcome to Stitchery Stories, where textile artists share their life in fabric and thread. Inspiration, techniques, disasters and delights. And I'm Susan Reeks, enthusiastic embroiderer and textile arts dabbler who also loves podcasting. So take a break and enjoy our light-hearted chat and please share with your friends so they can enjoy it too. Hello and welcome today to our lovely guest, Mana Lunt. Hi, Mana. Hiya. It's lovely to speak to you today. Now, Mana creates pictures, brooches and lampshades with thread in a painterly way. Inspired by the layers of texture and colours from her childhood home on the North Yorkshire Moors, she creates a mix of landscapes, portraits and floral still life, concentrating on texture and the feeling of the thread. So there we are, that's a manner in a nutshell. Sort of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, I'm, I'm sure we'll come, come to the sort ofs later on. Manor, we've connected on Instagram and you're quite busy on there, aren't you, Manor? In fact, I think the first time I saw your work was you were doing one of these like thread toba or something. Were you doing a oh, lot of flowers or something yeah. like that? Yeah. In October, I did the, they did like an Inktober and yes, I, um, I think some, I think it might have been Adam Pritchett, is it Pritchett? Um, yes, Pritchett. yes. He, um, I'd follow him and he's lovely and um, he was doing uh, like a Stitchtober and I thought that sounds like something to kind of pick me up in the winter months. So I started doing that as like a practice for myself mm. and that was really really enjoyable and so then I did Threaduary which was in February and <laughs> uh, I did the same sort of thing a flower each day but I did them as separate pieces of work and I put a lot more preparatory work into it and everything so yeah I think that's possibly where I think where it was there. because I think at the time I'd connected with Adam as well so I remember because he was one of a guest from a couple of a couple of well months ago I was going to say ages ago actually in yeah. terms of the podcast um yeah and she so was telling me telling me about that and that it was about the same time I think I probably mm-hmm. clicked from one you know you do you click from yeah. one to another to another ooh, ooh, yeah. ooh, yes so, yeah. <laughs> yeah so I thought I was I was greatly admiring the fact that every day you did something and you did quite a lot as well and it was beautiful yeah. flowers and I thought and the the style in which you did it caught my eye as well and as we were just talking before and we'll get on to it's this idea of the painter doing using thread in a painterly way so I think that's a very strong theme that comes across yeah now before I forget we can see more about mana on your website Um, when when I keep it updated it's great yeah (laughs) (laughs) To, to know what I'm doing on a daily basis I keep Instagram updated the best and yes I have a Facebook page as well which is where I started off really right but, yeah, the websites are pretty it's a pretty good place to go and and find general information about me and where I am and what I'm doing brilliant and that's manalund.co.uk so that's again right. All of Mana's links and some examples of her work will be on Mana's episode on the stitcherystories.com website as well. Yeah, go along and, and find her on Instagram. She's at Mana Lunt on there and Facebook, yeah, Mana Lunt Artist, aren't you? So yeah. there we yeah. are. Brilliant. So that's got the links out of the way before I forget. <laughs> so Mana, before we get started with your stitchery story today, would you like to share with us what you're working on at the moment and what's got you excited? I'm doing quite a large project at the moment, which seems to be going on forever because I keep on picking more elaborate projects as we go along with it. But it's a project called Guiding Lights, where I stitch um, inspirational women onto lampshades, thus being the light thing. Um, And it was a project that me and one of my close friends decided to do together. And it was, I think it was primarily to really keep me going while I was in quite a bad way with my mental health. And so it was something that we could talk about and bond about and get excited about. Yeah. Um, and I found picking in, inspiring women really good because it, it opened a conversation with me and my daughter and we learned about uh, all these women doing amazing things all the time. And uh, it's been a really good talking point um, with loads of people, actually. Yes. Um, so I've done, the first one I did um, was a small Frida Kahlo, just to see how it went. Then I went into Sylvia Plath. Um, and my friend who I'm doing it with is Andy from Vinegar and Brown Paper, uh, who etches beautiful and clever things on glass um, mm. and uh, plays with words and things. So I did a, a Sylvia Plath 
lampshade and he etched a bell jar with a saying from the bell jar on it, which the um, shade is within. Yes. Um, then I did Vivian Westwood. Oh, brilliant. Double sided one and he etched big safety pins to go through, so <laughs> very punky. Um, then we did Ada Lovelace with a, fr- a flight altimeter within the shade that he's etched. And now I'm doing another Frida one. I'm revisiting Frida again because the first one I've changed in my style so significantly. Right. A huge one with four portraits of Frida on it. Right. So that's quite, quite time consuming, but it's... Yeah. She's the best subject ever because she's so colourful and I love Mm -hmm. colour and really elaborate and you can really have fun with all sorts of textures and have, um, so that's the thing I'm doing at the moment, um, which I'm really enjoying. Yeah, I'm not surprised. And that's in itself been interesting just to hear that because I've seen these lampshades and I'm thinking, Mm -hmm. why is she doing a face on the that's an interesting that's an interesting way to do it i'll tell you what though the other last week i saw like a documentary film about vivian westwood it was brilliant and i thought wow again i just love the story behind it all you know and punk and all that it was uh, in my early teenage years so i found that fascinating i'll go and have to find your vivian then because i haven't seen that one (laughs) oh yeah it was um it's a double-sided one so there are two different portraits and then there's a union jack flag kind of floating in the background yeah with some paint splatters there's three giant safety pins that he's actually never mind the bollocks on it yeah so uh, it's been brilliant I've really really enjoyed doing them um but I need to be quicker at them because they're they're taking me too long to do it's all very well doing a project for a little while but I don't want it to take a year (laughs) well it's already taken a year I don't want to take another 10 years just to get it finished so um it's difficult balancing that along with everyday work that you need to be able to sell um yes these lampshades are really more seen as I'm not even really thinking of the selling behind it yeah. I'm more just thinking of the conversation that they can start and being able to put them in a gallery um to show everybody I, I want to do well-known people to begin with because yes. obviously that makes it an easier for people to understand that mm-hmm. what I'm trying to do but I really want to look into lots of inspirational women that have just been forgot- forgotten through time um, there's so many as well and people oh, so many so so much as well you think why mm. why is this lady just been forgotten there's, yeah. there's just fundamental things it, oh, don't get me started on that so yeah. I'm with you on that I think that's absolutely yeah. fantastic well done on that one thanks <laughs> <laughs> so, that's what I'm doing at the moment anyway yeah. along with like trying to do miniature things so I'm trying to do the same thing but in miniature on brooches because so many people I've had such a lovely response from people about them but yes. they're and they want to buy things to do with it but these would be so out of people's price range you know it'd be thousands of pounds because of the amount of man hours in them yes yes and so I've started doing little brooches I started with Frida again because she's just too much fun yes. <laughs> So I've done a couple of brooches and I've started trying to sell them, you know, so people can actually have something affordable to keep yes. and enjoy as well. Yeah, that's that's a nice idea too. I think just to add that balance and variety and as you say, give people an opportunity as well. So how therefore we mentioned about right at the start about doing things in thread in a painterly way. Mm. So therefore, how did you first get interested in embroidery and textile art? Was there a, a a pivoting point or did it evolve are you a painter at heart I'm definitely a painter at heart I've always right. painted um I did a degree I did fine art at Manchester School of Art and so I've, I've always been in art education and then it's always it's always been about oil painting and drawing mm-hmm. um and I'm very passionate about that and art history so I used to study that as well so that they're, they're the main things that kind of run through my blood and and, and are very important to me Textiles has always been important to me, but I don't think I appreciated how much. Going back to things like when when you're a child, you have a security blanket and the feel of that fabric against you brings you comfort. So obviously I had a deep affiliation with fabric and the comfort it can bring and the calmness it can bring. Um, and I have done, you know, I did embroid little and um, cross stitch kits when I was at school and things, but I don't really count those to be honest. Yeah. Um, so it it wasn't ever a area that I thought I would go into or had any plans to do anything with. Um, but it really all happened when I had my first child. I had my son Arthur. He was born with brain damage and had quite severe disabilities. And because of that, that meant that I couldn't return to work in a normal way because I had yes. to be a carer as well as his mum. 
and you know the amount of hospital appointments I'd have to take him on I'd never get a job that would allow me to have that amount of time off so I started needing some sort of creative outlet because of the obviously the the normal mum sort of things you you want to have your own identity but then with the added kind of stresses and worries about um how he would develop what would happen but yeah um, if you'd make it and all this kind of thing so to be able to um, balance that I did start trying to get back into painting a bit and I they r- randomly discovered Facebook business really you know the way that people had set up pages and it yes you know when you have so much time off sometimes as well you're just scrolling on the internet and mm-hmm. thinking what am I doing and I just put on some pictures of things that I'd made um, just to see what people thought. And I used a business name of Little A Designs because it's Little Arthur. And um, things kind of went a bit crazy. And as I think two days after I put pictures on, people started asking me to make them things. So mm. I started making cushions and hearts and lots of personalised, quite baby-related things because I was very much in that little zone. Good, yeah. And that went from strength to strength. And kind of snowball somehow and I ended up with I think it was 80,000 followers <laughs> yeah it went a bit crazy and it went it went quite crazy quite quickly yes uh, and it was a good form of income but um it wasn't very satisfying artistically because yes. you're kind of making the same things all the time I was getting copied so much it was all becoming a bit much and the amount of attention on Facebook that I was getting for having so many people follow me I found very very overwhelming right yeah not one of those people that embraced the kind of popularity I was just like oh my god all those people looking at me (laughs) what's gonna happen and I found it a little scary but mainly above all things I just wasn't satisfied with the work that I was putting out there yes went in front of a bus tomorrow would you really be proud of the legacy you'd left and I wasn't so I realized I needed to change things and so that's why I started doing lampshades and then lots of landscapes and more appliqued artworks and that led further on. But the reason why I chose embroidery when I had Arthur was because I knew that I couldn't paint anymore in the same way. When I'm painting and when I was doing oil painting, um, I needed complete focus, no interruptions, mm. I could stop and start. I just couldn't do that. And you can't do that with a little baby. No. So I realised that hand stitching I did find quite calming and that was quite a nice thing to do and also it was something I could put in my bag and do while he was on, in hospital so it was really portable and it just made sense um so that's kind of how it accidentally all happened to be honest just did it was mainly a plique I didn't know how to stitch anything I'd never really been taught anything so everything I did was back stitch oh well I like back stitch yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it worked <laughs> it was it did okay um, and I still only use about three or four stitches. Yeah. That's all I need to do. So yeah. um, um, I can use more if I want to, but generally I don't need to because it's the mark making process that I use it for. Mm. But, um, yeah, I was, so I just self taught myself, and each each kind of week I'd, I'd kind of explore different possibilities with it. Um, but that's why I started, all because of, of Arthur, really. Yeah, so ne- necessity really was at the, uh, the root of that. Therapy first, and then the fact that it made money was suddenly something I just hadn't considered. So to merge the two was pretty idyllic, to be honest. Exactly. And you've developed that. It is a very painterly style. So you can Mm. see it's quite a unique style that you've evolved as well for yourself. That's what attracted my attention when I saw something on Instagram. that's, That's really interesting. I suppose, therefore, thinking about inspirations, you've still got your art head on, have you? Yeah, whenever I do any any sort of textile work, it is always based on the art side of things. Yeah. Um, although I, f- I love embroidery art, I and mean, I really love it, and particularly the, the contemporary art um, embroidery scene at the moment, there's a huge amount of just incredible talent, which I'm yes. very inspired by. Um, but it's never been in my background to look at embroidery. Um, so my influences are still the influences from you know, as I was learning about them. So I'm very inspired by Italian Renaissance because I find that fascinating. I found the art history behind that fascinating. And it taught me a huge amount about what, how I produce work and colour theory and form 
So I'm still keeping all of those things that I've learned right at the forefront. You know, it's really important to me and yes. doing life drawing and, and studying the art of, of being able to produce, you know, flesh tones and things mm-hmm. like that. But um, my biggest inspirations are probably, I mean, Matisse is a massive one. I just think yes. you know, his colour is just dreamy. Um, and I love Bonnard. Um, I just, there's too many to, to be able to actually <laughs> And Fra Angelico, and but there's yeah, it's it's to do with painting. I, you know, I'm always sucked into painting. Yeah, and then you mentioned in your bio there, and uh, certainly on your website, you make note of it as well by the textures and colours of the the North Yorkshire moors, which are just stunning. I mean, I'm just further down the co- east coast at yeah. Hornsey, but I've spent a lot of my childhood years walking the moors, yeah. walking the Yorkshire Dales, walking, I did the World's Way a couple of weeks ago. So it is just beautiful, isn't it? So that yeah. also comes through as a, as a major inspiration as well, obviously. I was born, well, in Middlesbrough, but my parents have always lived in the same place, which is in Leal Home on the North Yorkshire moors. All oh, right, yes. <laughs> and that's where I've just been this weekend, actually. Yeah, just doing the retreat <clears throat> was in Leal Home. Yeah. Um, and so and um, we weren't in the centre of the village. We were in the house that was a mile out and uh, you can only see Moorland. So yeah. every single day, I just found it very, very fascinating. And it's something that is just in my thoughts constantly, is that every day I looked out of the window and every, the same scene looked so different every single day. Yes. And that's the textures, but also the colours. Um, and they were very dramatic d- during different seasons and weather conditions and different times of day. And in that respect, Monet was like a big influence because he mm. studied lots of those sorts of things. Yes. When I see um, any object, whether it be a fern or, a, I don't know, a cat or a car, um, <laughs> maybe quite mundane subjects, but I'll see the tiny details of something um, and I want to study the different textures that are within that. So when you look on the moors, it isn't just the moors, it isn't just a bit yeah. of heather. You look at the peat and the burnt twigs and blossom and then there's some sheep um, hair that's been wool even, <laughs> um, that's yeah. been dragged over something. And it, it, you just, you notice so many of these tiny little differences in the colours. It, it's part of you. It is, it really is, yeah. Yeah, and that just reminds me, and I, I think I, I think I forgot to say about your website. You've got that lovely video as well, where you're uh, sat there, you're sat in a chair with a lampshade or something. It's just a bit of a domestic scene in the middle of the moors, which I, I just love that video. It was really nice. Well, the, the photo shoot initially was just me and my friend Charlotte, and Charlotte's a photographer, right. photography, and she is one of my best friends up here. And uh, we, I just went to her, oh, you know, I need some profile pictures for a magazine article, and. Um, I just thought I'd just take my chair onto the moors and she'd be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> All right, let's just do it. <laughs> so we just whacked it in the car and um, it, for, it was that photo shoot that some everybody suddenly started going, what? And, what? <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that was a really a big thing, actually. That was quite a, a good photo shoot and it was just a random chat over a cup of tea one day. Um, and then the yeah. film kind of went on from that when I needed something and it was r and yeah. collaborations who that for me who were just amazing. Uh, really good fun that was that was something a bit different anyway <laughs> well so that was just an aside because I, I I like videos and things now then we mentioned just briefly there about techniques and backstitch and using thread so thread is your medium isn't yeah, it that's how I would as opposed to paint yeah so you're an artist that uses thread rather than paint is your viewpoint on there probably the what I've come to after you know I struggled for quite a long time with the idea of a text being called a textile artist um because I felt that I was that was a lie somehow because I'd never studied anything to do with embroidery or textiles I didn't know anything mm. about it and I still don't really uh, yeah I don't know all about technicalities of dyeing things and you know I can't use a machine I'm a nightmare with a machine um, it doesn't do what I want instantly, so I want to throw it out of the window. It's yeah. incredibly frustrating, but but my hands do do what I want them to do. So yeah. it's been quite a while to, in my head, decide that, yes, that's actually what I am, and it feels comfortable now finding that identity because mm. um, I don't feel that I stitch in a traditional manner at all. So you can do lots of th- um, thread painting and silk shading and people are mm. meticulous with their blending of it and I, I will look at it and think it's stunning um and I've even attempted it a couple of times but I got mind-numbingly bored doing it and that's not mm-hmm. a criticism of it it's just it didn't suit my headspace and the way that I work 
Yes. So I decided to just throw that out the window and just paint, uh, just, well, use the thread like I would paint. Do paint, yeah. Because you use quite thick thread as well, don't you? Because like it's traditional silk shading is like the yeah. thinnest little thread and one piece of it and all the rest yeah. of it. And you you have a much chunkier approach, as I say, like you would have with a brush full of paint. So, yeah, you can see that coming if through. If you're doing big oil strokes um, on a, a you know on a board, then it would be mm. heavily laden with a big thick brush. And then you go into the details with a thinner brush. But that's how I see thread. So you have to use big f- swathes of, of thread to be able to create the same sort of information. And then you can go in with detail and use um, different thread. But I also use different textured threads as well as thicknesses. So I'll yes. use the floss, but I'll also want to use linen and wool and just normal knitting yarn I use quite a lot of as well and darning wool. Mm. So I want to use kind of a whole range of different thread mediums as well. Yeah. And in terms of colour, so when you're doing faces, yeah. like traditionally when we're at school, you know, you're trying to get that exact pink felt tip, aren't you? We all have a, we all have a pink face yeah. or you know, we just help us out with trying to create that. What what does skin look like? I was, I was speaking to somebody last week, actually. Sorrel, her paintings, she'll be out the week before you. Okay. Again, is an interesting mixture of colour. Yeah. And that fascinates me that you look at a face on a portrait and you know who it is and there's bits of blue in mm. there. or you know, and, and, and I find that fascinating, how you come up with the colours that you're going to use to represent a face that doesn't have blue or yeah. pink or something, you know, think, green in it or whatever. Uh, this is a really interesting subject and I didn't realise it was as interesting to people as... Um, <laughs> I was just like, that's just what you do though, isn't it? You know, there's, and then this weekend I was had some students and we were talking about the thread therapy part, part of it and they were like, but why have you got that colour in there? It's a colour that I find really interesting about your work. I was just thinking, well, because it is in there. That's where, you know, that's what I can see when I look at something. Yeah. It, again, it goes down to that looking close up into the moors and it might look like a purple bit of bracken, but it's not just purple. It's got browns in there. There's, there's some paler pinks in there. There's blues in there because our eye doesn't just see a white colour or a pink colour. It sees huge. There's, there's a lot of colours within that to make up that colour. Um, you know and shadow and stuff then that again that's part of the art history thing that is really important to me so um over the years people have developed from a flat surface so everything is like completely 2d so pre-renaissance and everything everything was very 2d and then you get giotto coming into the um Mm. kind of scheme of things and he started using shading and starting to bring in a 3D effect and highlighting and shading. And I think there's Piero della Francesca is like a, a main person that was doing that. But before that, that didn't exist. Um, and then Leonardo mm. da Vinci comes along and goes, okay, mm. I'm going to put blue in the background of the landscapes of my portraits. That hadn't really been done before. But the blue recedes the, the eye. So all of these pieces of information that I've learned mm. from years and years of training are essential to what I do now so it's not just yeah. okay I'm going to get a bit of thread and I'm, I'm going to copy this so when people ask me to do patterns I'm like I, ca- I can't do a pattern for you because it is like me painting a picture and it's not it's yeah. not not a color by number thing yes yeah so you, there are blues and purples and greens in our faces you know there's um, there are veins, but there's, you know, you want to create depth in there. And um, I can't do that by mixing the threads because it's not paint. So I have to find the colour that I need raw to be able to put on there. Um, yeah. And that, again, that's where the layering comes from. So I put some mm-hmm. blue on there, but then I might put a flesh tone on there as well. And that you might not then know that there was blue on there, but underneath it will shine through the flesh a little bit because of the gaps in the stitches or whatever. So, um, yeah. again, this is all the, the fine art training. So I was trying to yeah. take somebody through a flower drawing and how we would do the thread painting. She's like, why have you just done that? And I was like, oh, <laughs> there, isn't it? And she's like, no, you're not there. Stop it. And I was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I was trying to explain to them how I was seeing yeah. things. It, it, it's quite tricky, but I think that's changed my direction is that I quite like the fact that nobody can copy what's in my brain. So. Well, this this is it, and that's what makes us all unique, yeah. isn't it? And, and the art that we do is unique. So, Well, that was a brilliant explanation. Thank you very much for that. And it's just something I'm quite a bit fascinated at the moment. So you've gone through how you've evolved and the fact that you see yourself as a, an artist who uses thread. Mm. So has there been a particular high point 
so far mana would you say in all of this I think that when I started out I had certain things in my head that I wanted to achieve and they were based on nothing at all other than (laughs) random things that I thought oh I'd really like to work with Liberty or I'd really like to be in a magazine and there were just weird things that you kind of just pluck out the air and yeah. Each time I achieved one of those things that was in my list, that was a high point. So I've had like lots of, yeah. the, there's not one that would be better than the others because I mean, I, I worked with the BBC on a programme a couple of years ago and that was an incredible experience and that has obviously launched yeah. the teaching side of my work. Massively. Yes. But it wasn't any more important than being accepted onto Made by Hand Online, which is an amazing craft um, website. And to be accepted onto that, was a massive deal to me because that meant that mm. they had s- selected my work and thought I was good enough to be put onto a website with other really really high class makers um, and yes. that is as much of an achievement as being on telly or being in a magazine or being in a book um, although the book thing's pretty cool <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, I mean Cass Holmes's new book and um, the landscape textile landscapes book which by the way you should, everybody should get because it is amazing and Cass is lovely so Yes, well, she was quite an early guest, yeah. was Kaz. So um, she was she was working on her book at the time. Where it must be about a year since I, I'd spoke to her. So uh, yeah, it was quite interesting to see that popped up yeah. last week. It looks really good. So that's really nice, though, that it's things are building on top of each other and have different meaning to yeah. you. So it's not just well, that was the best thing I've done, and now I, now I can't do that again, sort of thing. It's it's an evolution, it and I think we do that, don't yeah. we? It's all it's boosting your confidence at each time. So yeah. each of these things are kind of you, you tell yourself that you're not not good. Oh, I'll never be able to do that. I'm never going to be able to, mm. you know, achieve that. And then when it happens, it's like, oh my god, that was amazing. And you know, you you're allowed to savor that success and be really proud of it for a while yeah a rack in my studio of all the magazines I've been in and people might look at that and think what a very egotistical person but it's not it's me being no. actually why aren't I celebrating the things that I've done you know and we don't celebrate our achievements enough no. and we certainly don't celebrate the small things that we've done even in a day yeah. we don't celebrate and I think that's why people do start to sometimes feel isolated and fed up and all the rest of it is you know give yourself a break celebrate what you've just done you've achieved that it was amazing well done you've done something I got out of bed this morning to talk to you I'm quite proud of that (laughs) (laughs) I was really tired and I still did it (laughs) well done thank you so much for doing that but yeah it's it is so true all of these things are such a celebration so yeah we should all celebrate a bit more so so moving from celebrating and high points do you have any stories that we could have maybe a bit of a laugh about when something was possibly a bit of a disaster and importantly what did you learn from that man have you got anything there for us? Uh, I haven't got one specific thing my general day-to-day living is a little bit of a disaster <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I'm just one of those people that I'm a faffer uh, and I go <laughs> around the place in a little bit of a haze sometimes going oh what am I doing now and be talking to myself wandering around just like um yeah people will generally if they look through the window they would think I was mad <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a faffer Uh, Most places I go, I forget something. I thought I was really organised and I went around telling everyone how great I wasn't organised for a long time and then I realised that truth is I'm not. I am (laughs) absolute liability everywhere I go. Um, But, you know, it's fine. I deal with it. (laughs) I haven't, like, killed anyone yet, which is a bonus. Um, I've kept all the children (laughs) alive. And, you know, so again, let's celebrate the fact that... Let's celebrate that. Children are still alive. Yay. (laughs) And, um, yeah, not one particular disaster, sadly. Just daily. (laughs) (laughs) So that brings in a point there about organising. You're talking about your, you know, your your time. Mm. So how do you actually organise your creative time manner? Is there any specific process you have or a, a way of org- You know, how how do you do? I'm it? Just sitting, laughing to myself at the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I really um and. I really try. I have all of the notebooks. I have all of the calendars. I buy special pens to organise myself. Any, (laughs) basically, I do anything in a (laughs) to procrastinate the fact that I should be organising. So, I I mean, I do kind of organise myself, um, but it's not too strictly. Uh, I used to get very, very stressed about just everything, not being good enough about anything, and I've just Mm. learned that you know what 
whatever will happen will happen um i've just got to um i've just got to lay you know be a bit more chilled out and um i, I try and make sure i'm stitching every day but yes. it's a constant juggle you see because i don't have really a time where i can just stitch regularly every single day even though the kids are at school right. and stuff you'd think that would be mm-hmm. a time but you spend a lot of time organizing Arthur's life as well so there's um, medical appointments and exercises with him to do and then think about so he's kind of a full-time job my daughter is a full-time job and she has no issues at all other than me as well. <laughs> um, so I have a lot of time and I'm trying to spend more time actually with the kids and organizing that side of things and yes. fitting the stitching in around it I found that I was doing so much before that it was just it was ridiculous the amount of stuff that I was doing I was, I was teaching I was making online videos I was trying to do blogs I was doing fairs I was doing workshops everywhere um oh, crikey yeah just so much um and then I was trying to add on new things to do as well and I found that the more that I was doing that I was what you're really doing by filling up your life to such an extent is trying to escape something that must be wrong so during like the last couple of years um I've discovered that yeah I've gone to counseling a lot and that kind of thing and that has helped me reduce the amount of work that I'm doing make myself more sensible with the work that I'm doing and not being hard on myself and setting myself any deadlines and um, so right. at the moment I know that I've got two fairs coming up one in October and one in November I know I have to have work for that so each day I kind of think what would be nice to to be there there is panic setting in because of the amount of stuff I need to make and the time yes. that that takes um, and I keep on selling stuff which I know is a <laughs> really <laughs> stupid thing to say but I keep on selling stuff which is annoying me because I need it for my fair <laughs> <laughs> no. where I'm going to try and sell yeah, it well, yes sell it. I know yeah, exactly. so it's a stupid thing to say <laughs> and I'm aware of that <laughs> but in my head I'm like oh no I can't sell anymore <laughs> and so there's a, I, I'm just trying to um, look at each day separately and not plan ahead at all because that's when I panic right that's why uh, you know I've spent quite a long time the last particularly year and um, just saying no to things and trying to hide from everything a little bit to try and get my head mm-hmm. all more organized but I think as, as soon as you put too much pressure on yourself to do certain things by th- certain times um which used to work for me and um, I work well to deadlines and I still work well to deadlines um but yeah it's being able to say no to things to to fit things in and being a bit more sensible and looking after yourself so I'm a little bit more laid back towards everything now and just hope it all works out (laughs) which it does I mean nobody at the end of the day if I don't have 50 million pieces for a fair you know is it really the end of the world it's not really the end of the world is it Especially if you've been selling it while you've been doing it as well. I know you're trying to accumulate a body of things, aren't you? But yeah, it's it's not like you're making it and then throwing it in the bin, yeah, is it? It's like it. you're making it and somebody's actually giving you money for it, which is the whole point. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting balancing act, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's one that I haven't got right and I will never get right. Mm-hmm. And I'm very aware of that. Um, and I'm, I'm totally stopping to try and strive to get it right as well. Yeah. Um, because, you know, it, that takes up more time than doing anything else. Um, yeah yeah it's it doesn't do us any good at all does it really so yeah I know I'm a bit of a chronic over scheduler myself so uh, it's uh, yeah so it's it's an an ongoing thing I mean some people need that to keep them in Mm -hmm. order and that is fantastic and I I probably should have that to keep things in order a little bit um but I just at the moment I don't um I have every I know when everything's happening and I know that I have to make things work before then And I do make things work before then, but I don't have like a daily schedule because I've done a retreat this weekend. I know that now for the next couple of days, I'm going to be in too much pain to do anything. So I have to, Mm. I can't panic about what I should be doing now. I have to, No, I'm not doing anything now. Um, yeah you've you've got to go with what your body and your mind's telling you, haven't you? Because that's how we keep this sustainable. Exactly. So we just mentioned there quickly about you've got a couple of fairs coming up. After saying you don't kind of look for deadlines and so on, is there anything that you'd like to share with us for us to look out where we can see, you know, see what you're doing or mm-hmm. buy anything? So where where are your fairs? Anything that you to share with us, Mark? Yeah, I need to try and remember dates as well. I'm rubbish at this. But um, <laughs> a, a fair that I'm going to be at in, at the York Rakes course, which is And York, which is a brilliant like art and craft fair, which mm. is in October. It is at near towards the end of October 
and then at a fair in Masson in North Yorkshire, which, yeah, crafted by hand, which is amazing. I do everything on paper as well, by the way. I don't do anything on the computer, yeah. <laughs> which I should, because that would be so much more helpful. But well, yeah, I've ha- got both on the go. I, I just still like my diary, but I have to have my online thing for something else where people have got to book in. So I, I, have, to, I have to have two. So that oh. makes it worse. <laughs> <laughs> I tried the computer thing, but I was... I don't know why I found it. I was completely inept. Um, <laughs> I needed to do it by hand. I have to do everything by mm-hmm. hand. At the beginning of November, anyway, I'll be at Masson Town Hall for the Crafted by fan- Hand Fair. Brilliant. Um, so I'm really looking forward to doing those because it's been a couple of years since I've done any fairs. Yeah, that'd be nice then. And then at the beginning of next year, I'm at Cowslip for my last ever teaching. Right. Um, and I've got an exhibition there as well. That's at Cowslip Workshops yeah. in Cornwall. I'm going to be doing a thread therapy sort of painting-y, thread painting-y thing. <laughs> Technical title that was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thread thread therapy thingy painting thingy. Thingy p- painting thingy thread thing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just call it the thingy workshop. There you are. <laughs> yeah, sounds about right. <laughs> I shall have a dig around and find some links to put on your episode anyway. So. All right. <laughs> <laughs> We'll be there. <laughs> oh, well, there we are then. Right, do you know what, Mana? That's been really fantastic speaking to you, and particularly the unique aspects of your work and your approach to the colour and so on. It's been really, really interesting. And certainly that discussion as well about why do we all try and make ourselves go insane by doing too much yeah. and being so hard on ourselves? It's just a very, very interesting and very valuable thread through our discussion in our lives at the moment. Well, yeah, you shouldn't get to the point of a breakdown before you realise that it's time to uh, look after yourself a bit. No. Family first, yourself yourself and family first always. Exactly. No. So on those very wise words, I will say goodbye to you and thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and words with us today. It's been much appreciated, Mana, and we'll, um, we'll look out for you and your interesting work and I particularly love the, uh, the idea behind your lights as well, your Guiding Lights series. So thank you for thank sharing you. all of that with us. It's been fantastic. Oh, thank you. Pleasure. Bye. Bye. If you liked this episode and want to hear more, then please join the Stitch Me Stories fan club so you can get an email when a new episode is released. It's a quick and easy way of listening and of keeping up with any news and offers from our lovely guests. Please visit stitcherystories.com to join the fan club. Of course, if you have iTunes, then subscribe there to automatically get new episodes. And why not leave us a review and rating whilst you are there? So that is the end of our Stitchery story for today. So keep stitching, keep smiling and keep creating your very own Stitchery stories. 